You might be struggling with your identity and just need God to show up. Just, you don't know what's going on, but God, I need you right here. Or you might be going through transitions in life and just feel like you're on, stable, on unstable ground. So there's different characters in, this, in the Bible passage we're going to read today, and I just want you to think of, you know, where do you see yourself in the story? Okay, so if you can open up your Bibles with me to 2 Samuel chapter 6. So it'll appear on the screen up too. So just to preface this a little bit, in the context in 2 Samuel here, King David literally just won every battle. Like, all the enemies of God are defeated. Every last little bit of resistance against the kingship and ownership of the promised land of God is established. He's, he's the king. Everything's, all the battles are over. So what David wants to do is because God's given them victory on every side, he wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant to the city of David. So the Ark of the Covenant was out with them in the field of battle, and he wants to bring the Ark to the city of God, to Jerusalem. So if, could you put up the picture of the Ark? So for if you don't know, the Ark of the Covenant, who's seen Indiana Jones, the first one? Indian. Okay. All right. So you all, you're all familiar. You're historians on this. But uh, uh, in the Ark of the Covenant, it was literally built like a seat. So there's a box of wood and gold, and there's two angels on top almost holding them like, the, like a seat. So that's actually wrong. I, this is just a personal opinion. I think the sticks go the other way, because if God's sitting on it, he wouldn't sit sideways as you carry him. So, anyway, but, um, you know, that was, for the children of Israel, that was the presence of God on the earth. He sat on that throne, and when they put him in the temple, they called that the mercy seat. Because even as unholy people who go through the process, when they approach God, he would sit there in mercy and deal with unholy people before him. Because that's how merciful and just he is. So that's what the Ark of the Covenant, it's the physical presence of God. And we know God's obviously has a physical presence here on the earth today still. And we can feel him in our church and in our homes and everything like that too. So he's going to bring that, take that out from outside the camp and bring it up into the city of Jerusalem. And that's where our story picks up. So in 2 Samuel 6, verse 1, it says, Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. So that's, he sits right on that throne. So I love this, these few verses. It talks about how the army of God's there, the king's there. And like, could you get more kingly than like, it's known by the name, the Lord of hosts. And the Lord of hosts means the Lord of armies. Like he just, like, yeah, I did the army thing. I beat all your enemies. And that's how good God is. Um, so verse three, here's where the story gets a little interesting. So they set the ark of God on a new cart and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. So we're going to spend a little bit in this verse, and we're going to unpack some of these things. So you know me, I love, if I see a name, I'm like, what does the name mean? i got to find out. So we're going to go through that. Abinadab means the father is generous. Who here, the father is generous? Who thinks that, right? Praise God. So obviously the, the sons come out of that, out of that revelation that, you know, God is generous, and there's two, two sons. So there's Uzzah, which means strength. Obviously, they, you see the strength. Uzzah sounds like a, a tough guy's name. Like if you meet someone on the street and they say your name's Uzzah, you're going to be like, oh, all right, all right, cool, nice to meet you. Um, and then there's Ahio, and his name means brotherly. So when I think of that, or brother of God it can mean. So I think of that as relationship. So you see there's two co-equal parts here. There's, there's strength and there's relationship. And I think we need both in our lives, amen? So, you know, we know our Father is generous, and we need our strength in a relationship with God to go forward. So I think here's the interesting part. You know, whenever the, when the Bible, when God puts, like, little words and phrases in, I was like, why does he put that there? So it says they put a new cart. And I was like, oh, that's kind of funny. You know, they, they emphasize, this is a new cart. This is cool. You know, sometimes don't we do that in our lives? Like, we'll kind of pop the collar a little bit. You know, we got the new cart. 
you know, we got the biggest cart, maybe a little Trump, like we got the best cart. Everyone's been saying that. Everyone tells us it's the best cart. And they brag about how, how new the cart is that they brought the ark out on, that they're moving the presence of God with this cool new thing. But is that where the ark belongs? No. First Chronicles 15.15 15 says, And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles, just like the picture was, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. So God said, hey, the presence goes on your shoulder, on your close, uh, right, right close here, right by your ear. That's where the presence of God belongs. That's where he moves. But the people of God weren't honoring him rightly. They put it on an ox cart. So to me, I was just kind of dumped. The Lord just kind of highlighted this all to me that there's Uzzah, which means strength. And then there's also that's contrasted with relationship. And then God's supposed to, we're supposed to ha- carry his presence on our shoulders. That's the relationship. That's closeness. But then there's also the ox cart. Oxes are strong. How many know oxen are super strong? They're beasts of burden, right? The oxes, they could pull anything. They can pull a plow through the field. They're the strongest as it can be. But we're not supposed to carry the ark of God on a cart. It's not just by our own strength. It's about our relationship with him. So I feel like this is, this is a choice that we all have in our lives. You know, How do we honor the presence of God? Is it something that's a burden to us that we feel like, oh, we just got to toughen up and you know, try to be a good Christian and listen to him and obey him and serve him? Or is this a blessing? Is something that rests on us? That's a mantle. So it's not by, not just by your strength. So I was wondering, where does, where do, where'd they get the ox cart? Where'd that come from? Well, what's interesting is that it's not something that they planned to do, but in way back when, before David, The Ark of the Covenant was like the presence of God, right? And eventually the people just stopped honoring God. They were like, yeah, he's cool. He's great. You know, but we're strong. We've got this. We're the the army of God. We go out to battle. And then literally one battle, they're like, hey, who grabbed the Ark? Who brought it? You know, like everyone's like, who was supposed to bring the Ark? And they're like, someone run back and get it real quick. (laughs) And then they treated like the Ark of God, like the throne that was supposed to go before them, almost like a totem or like a magic, just a little, you know, something that would bring them a good luck charm. And so they're like, ah, well, just, just throw it on the front of the army. Well, of course, God's not going to honor that. He's not something you just, ah, just put him on there. You know, just sprinkle him on your week a little bit. Just read your Bible a little bit. It's fine. He's good to go. So the Philistines beat him, and the Philistines took the ark. So what's funny is they didn't honor God rightly either. That's a whole story. But they ended up getting warts and all sorts of bad stuff. So they're like, we don't want it. You can have it back. So the Philistines put it on an ark, or uh, put it on an ox cart, and they sent it out, literally just like shooshed it out of town, like you can have it, do whatever. And since then, they just kind of left it there. So they weren't honoring God rightly in their lives, and they just treated it like, hey, maybe he's mad or something, I don't know. So ever since then, you know, we have to determine too in our lives, how are we going to honor God? We have to realize that our authority, so it says that in Isaiah 9, 6, It said the government would be on his shoulders. So the authority of God rests on our shoulders. The government's his authority. That's where the presence of God is supposed to sit right on us, right? So we have to decide how are we going to, are we going to carry it close to us? Be consistent, let it rest on us? Are we just going to try to do this stuff in our own strength? Um, So you can see the divine misalignment already. They're out of order with God. They're disobeying his word. They think an ox cart's good enough for them. So I I think this is a picture of us, that sometimes it's just easier for us to emphasize our own strength, that, you know, getting close and having the relationship and authority with God, that can be hard. You know, maybe if I have to go pray, I have to listen, and that could be a while. I have to be quiet and read, you know, read a Bible. I don't know if a verse or two will cut it. Maybe I've got to read a whole bunch. That's an investment. I don't know if I've got time for that, right? So I want to continue on in verse 4. It says, and they brought out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbals. 
So you see all the religious activity and pageantry and excitement and everything that, you know, they did, didn't make up to the fact that they weren't being obedient to God and weren't being holy before him. So verse 6 says, And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, so if you could put up the picture of the threshing floor, it says, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. So if you can see the picture of the threshing floor, it's not like a giant big stumbling block thing that's going to trip you up. It's pretty, pretty mellow there. So again, I'm going to look up what all these words mean. So Nacon means prepared. And the threshing floor, for those of you who don't know, back in the day when they cut down a bunch of grain, you got to separate it. So what they did is they dump it in this circle and they take these oxen and they'd run over it and basically it would separate the wheat from the chaff, the good stuff from the bad stuff, the stuff you can actually eat from what's fake and it's not going to do you any good. So I like to, the threshing floor, I like to think of it as it's kind of like a place of judgment, like what's real and what's not. It separates the real from the fake. So if I'm, if I'm getting a picture of what this means when they're the army, the children of God, they have the presence of God. They just came off of, you know, big battles and victory and everything before the Lord. And then they come up to a little place of testing. You know, it's not those big battles. It's just where, it, you know, you determine if you're real or not. And that's what causes them to stumble. Like that, you, you just defeated 10,000 Philistines and everyone else. But then all of a sudden, just this little every day, you're just in your normal walk with God. You stumble. So I wanted to ask you, what do you do when your oxen stumble? What do you do when your strength fails? How do you handle it? How do you honor the presence of God in those times? You see, when the real tests come, how do you respond? For instance, Uzzah, so Uzzah means strength. What's he do? He grabs the ark of God. Okay, I got this, guys. I'll keep it steady. It's like, that's just manipulation and trying to force it. You know, if we're not going to be holy people of God who are obedient and let him flow through us, guess what? Sometimes we might feel, hey, I got to gotta make things happen in my life. I got to do what I need to do to make sure things get going, right? So even if that means being unholy and pushing the ark of God where it needs to go, that's, that's what the result of sin gets you. Manipulation. You're trying to work, you know, maybe it's working systems around you to, to get people to think certain things or... In reality, you've just fallen from grace and you stumble in your faith. And I'm here to tell you that even if you're the strongest warrior, full of prayer, devotion, in covenant, doing everything you can, there'll be times when your strength, you just fail. Your strength just can't hold out. But keep listening, there's hope. So in verse 7, it says, Then the anger of the Lord was roused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark. So imagine this like beautiful, glorious scene. Everyone's singing and dancing and shouting. God gave us the victory. Oh, stumbles, he grabs it, and all of a sudden, us is dead. Like, what brings a halt to the the fun and all the partying more than that? And all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, no, what happened? So that just halts. And, you know, that's when the, the misalignment or the disobedience or the disorder in your life, when it manifests, That's what it looks like. All of a sudden, all the fun might come crashing to a halt in your life. So we might try to use our brute strength to push God where we need to go or make things happen or make it look right to get things back on track, and we can't. We can't by our own strength. We can't just brute strength to where it needs to go. And it's not just because we can't fake it, but God doesn't honor that. He doesn't honor the fake and all the pageantry over the top Yeah, because he's holy. So I know sometimes I felt like, just like in verse 8, it says, And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah. So it's crazy. Like all of a sudden, is God mad? But yeah, he's holy. He didn't like that. But God's not mad at everybody. If anyone's mad, David's mad in this scenario, too. He's mad at the whole situation, and that's, that's what sin gets you. It just gets you frustrated. But the name Perez Uzzah means the breach of strength or the defeat of strength, the defeat of might. 
Because at the end of the day, all of our strength and everything we put on to look good, every, be, you know, every piece of warrior armor we have that we put on to show people we're the mighty people of God, it's going to fail. And we can't just put it on and fake it. And I think it's, I think it's interesting, too. He's mad, at, you know, he's mad about that because God missed his expectations. He thought, you know, I had a plan, okay? It was going to be great. We had all the trumpets and everyone lined up. We're going to take the ark and put it in the city of David. It's going to go great. And all of a sudden, his plan's ruined. And he just doesn't know what to do. Has anybody ever been there when your plan, everything you had perfect, and now you don't know what to do, right? He's confused and upset. So, and the thing I thought, too, is like, that's got to be humiliating, right? Like, David as the king and the mighty warrior of everybody, and he's a big instrumentalist, too. Like, they, they defeat everything. Like, he gets to look amazing in battle, just destroying all the enemies of God. And then all of a sudden, like, everything comes to a crashing halt halfway to the city because an ox stumbled. It's like, that's got to be the most embarrass- embarrassing thing. He's like, I'm the king, and this whole thing fell apart. That's humiliating, right? So that's what happens to us, too. And what I thought was most interesting is you see the contrast between, between these two brothers. So remember, which person in the story are you? Are you feeling like King David or you feel like Uzzah? Do you feel like the other brother? So there's Uzzah's strength, right? He's the one that touched the ark and tried to push it and make things happen, and he ends up dead. And then there's Ahio. So it doesn't say anything about Ahio. He's the one, his name means kind of relationship, the brotherhood. He's just fine. So it's during those testings that it's not just our brute strength, it's our relationship that sees us through. So where are you? Where do you feel that you are? And just to build on this, I will say not only is it that our relationship with God is what preserves us when strength fails, it's the only thing that gets us through. So verse 9, it says, David was afraid of the Lord that day. So when you don't have a plan, what's your first instinct? Right away, you're afraid. And not just of the circumstances. He's afraid of the Lord. You know, he's like, I thought we were good. I thought we had everything squared away, and now this is happening. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So right away, you see the lie of the enemy just creep in, right? Oh, well, how could God come near to me? Well, you know, that's a sell, all my, my saved even. You know, this week I was so bad, or I gossiped and did all that stuff. Am I even saved? I don't even know. Am I still in the love of God? Am I in the grace of God? Doesn't that happen? All of a sudden, the enemy just spirals this whole thought thing, and you try to shut it off, and you keep spiraling and spiraling. Yeah, so how is his relationship doing right now? It's in question, right? And so why was he afraid? Why did he become so afraid of God? So yes, God was mad at sin. He doesn't tolerate that because he's holy. Um, But it ended up because he was mad. He was the one that put the space there. So it was the law, and everyone knew the law back then. That was like it. They had the Torah. They studied it, read it out loud, taught it to their kids. They could memorize it all. And they knew no one could touch the ark of God because he's holy. But that's, that's the first thing that sets in with David. He's like, I can't let God near my house. You ever feel like that? Like, hey, I haven't been good. I'll be in church on Sunday. We're all good and in the grace of God. Amen, right? But then when you go home, well, it's a little bit different of a story, right? Well, now I've got to walk it out. Just like Jimmy last night. Who was here last night for Jimmy's message? That was amazing. That was an amazing message. Where all of a sudden you've got to let your light shine. It's easy in church. Outside of church, sometimes we want to hide our light a little bit. So that's the first thing. He's like, I can't bring God up to where, you know, to my house. Because he thinks, what is he? He assumes that God has rejected him. And I want to tell you guys today that if you're in that situation, I just wanted to speak life to you that God has not rejected you. Even if you fell even if you're in sin, even if you had to push it and fake it, and you feel so far away from him, he has not rejected you. I'll tell you too, he's holy. Yes, he's holy, but he hasn't rejected you. So the story continues in verse 10. It says, So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David. But David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom. So there's the separation. Who left him? Did God leave him? No, who left who in this scenario? David is the one who's like, okay, well, I can't be near God. i got to step away from this. But this verse is just an obscure little verse. 
but it was such an interesting thread. Uh, who's Obed-Edom? So all of a sudden they're like, eh, we left it by uh, Obed-Edom. Okay, and then the story continues on, but there's just a little thread that I pulled out, and I want to share with you guys about who this guy is, because it's, it's just crazy cool. But, um, so one thing I wanted to say, so the city of David, that was like David's little hometown area, and David means the beloved. That's what his name means, right? And that's his identity. He's the beloved one of God. But guess what? It got him questioning. He said, oh, I might, I might be called beloved. I might be called loved by God, but guess what? I can't be near him. So who's Obed-Edom? Has anyone even heard of Obed-Edom before? Oh, yeah, my wife has. Yes. <laughs> so I feel bad for Obed-Edom. He's got a cool part of the story, and I bet he never had a flannel graph made of him. You know those little flannel graphs he used to put on the board for Sunday school? He never got a flannel graph, I'm sure. But... Uh, so I want you to think who you, are, who you are in this story. Remember David, he feels far away. He, he's messed up. He's a big warrior, but he stumbled. And then there's Obed-Edom. So I want to tell you a little bit about Obed-Edom. Because if you think about it, this is just like a weird thing. They got this big whole plan. Everything falls apart. And there's this guy there, and they're like, hey, can we keep the Ark of the Covenant in your garage for a little bit <laughs> until we figure out what to do? And he's like, yeah, sure. Right? So there's a whole lot more to his story. So Obed-Edom, his name means servant of Edom. Edom just means red. So if you think about his identity as a servant, so that's a question. He's not a warrior, he's a servant. He was a Levite from a family of Korites. So those are the people who did all the service and all the kind of like lowly work in the temple. They did all the grunt work to make sure everything went off smoothly. But it was those people who had the servant's heart that the, the presence of God was there with. Those were the ones that kept everything going. So you might just think, I just run sound or media or help out in the coffee house. I'm just a servant kind of a thing just because I love the church and I'm happy to help. It's a small thing. But if you're doing it and honoring God, he blesses that and puts his presence there. So I read in a, a good book by Mark Casto. He's a Church of God minister, but he has a book called When Misfits Become Kings, which is really good. But page 131, he talks about Obed-Edom and he said, Obed-Edom means the servant who honors God in the right way. So you see that contrast. They, the people of God weren't honoring God rightly. They, weren't, they just weren't doing the right things. They weren't major sin, doing all this horrible stuff, but they didn't have the obedience part, right? So it says, he honors God in the right way. Rabbinical literature also tells us that while the ark was in Obed-Edom's house, he would light a candle to it twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. This was an act of worship in order to host the presence of God properly. So he honored God and he was in reverent worship. You know, the, the presence of God was not being honored rightly by a million people, but one man decided that for three months, I'm just going to honor God. I'm going to host his presence. I'm going to seek him. I'm going to worship him and honor him rightly, even if it's just me alone in front of this. So I think what's so cool is that if he's only briefly glanced over, but that thread kind of continues about how God honors our worship and how he honors us when we honor his presence. So Obed-Edom, he's just a guy, you know, he, they, he lent them his garage to, to hold on to the ark of God. But his story continues. So later on in 1 Chronicles 15, verses 16 to 21, you see that all of a sudden Obed gets a little bit of a promotion, right? Obed-Edom volunteers as a singer. So again, if you're reading through those verses, you never pick up his name again. It says in 1 Chronicles 15, 24, he, he volunteers as a doorkeeper. A little bit of promotion. 1 Chronicles 16, verse 5 and 38, all of a sudden, Obed-Edom is a minister before the ark of the Lord. A little bit of obedience and reverence and worship. And God promotes and honors that. So I love that, too, because I try to live my life that way. But I, the thing I love is I was trying to think about my next generation and the legacy I'm going to leave behind in my kids. I don't have any kids yet, but I'm going to. So um, the thing I love is that his devotion and his worship and his service wasn't just for him. It had a blessing that went on to the next generation. So it says, uh, you know, it's not just for you. It's, he leaves it behind a heritage. First Chronicles 26, verses 4 to 5 and I won't read it because it names off all his kids. He has eight kids, and they're all long and hard to pronounce names. Um, and all of a sudden, 
his kids have kids. And all of a sudden, they're, they get promoted and are doing all the stuff in the temple. And they get to serve God and honor him too. And it says, all total, 62 kids of Obed-Edom from his kids and his grandkids. And they're all serving and honoring God in the temple. It's like, that's amazing. In 2 Chronicles 15, it says, to Obed-Edom, he gets the south gate. So his promotion didn't even stop at ministering before the Lord. He, he oversees a gate in the city of God. <laughs> and he's given authority over that. Because that's how it works when you, when you honor God rightly. Even if it's in the small things, he rewards that with big things. Um, oh, and his sons were also made rulers over the storehouse. So I just wanted to take a minute and just, you know, just think about you right now. And praise God, you're in church and you're honoring him today. And you've made time set aside for him. And when we had the worship, it was wonderful. And you lifted up a song of worship from your heart to him. And just think about the effect that that has, that that has in your kids Think about the start that they're already set off on a better track in church already. And maybe you weren't raised in church, but they are. Think about how how much of a legacy that they're going to leave behind for their kids of a godly legacy. I think that's amazing. (laughs) So just think think like that. Like, God, if I do this, what's what's the outcome? Not just for me, like, hey, I get a bunch of cool stuff in heaven or a mansion, you know, in the streets of gold, but... What does that do for your kids and their kids and their kids' kids? How does that change a nation, right? So I just wanted to, the, to shout out you, all the people who are servants of God. And even if it's not serving in church, if you serve God and honor him with your, your morning ritual and your Bible study and all that kind of stuff, he, he, he sees that and he knows that and he honors that. And he remembers that. So if we're comparing, remember, who are you in this story? Or you may be like Obed-Edom, that all of a sudden you're just like, I was kind of doing my thing. That's kind of like my story. And all of a sudden God shows up, right? And he just starts blessing, and he does all this cool stuff. And it's like, I don't even know how I got here. If I had to explain the whole long story, it's like, but for God, all of a sudden he showed up and did cool stuff. You know, or maybe you're like David, like, hey, I, I do all this stuff, and I crush the things, and I'm just a super good warrior. I might stumble and fall, but I'm still there. So I think, you know, as we have like the relationship part, Obed-Edom, We have the strength part, David, and the warrior, and Uzzah. We need both. Neither's wrong, but it has to go in proper order. Relationship has to go first. And I would even say that, you know, our relationship is what gives us our strength. And David knew that. He was a worshiper. How many know that David was a worshiper? He didn't start out as the warrior. He started out as the harpist. All of a sudden, the crazy, angry king, and they're like, hey, somebody get a guitar real quick. He's like, (laughs) I got you. You know, (laughs) he comes running out. So that's how he got his start, too. That's where your strength comes from. So all of a sudden, verse 12, so I'm going to pick back up the story, Act 2, right, of this little movie. Verse 12, it says, Now it was told to King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. He's like, oh, okay, (laughs) so things are good again. All right, well, I'll run out there. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. So you see, not only does David see the change in what happened, but he see the change in Obed-Edom's life and the impact the presence of God had. And he's like, well, if God can do it for him, he'll do it for me too, right? That's what I love about David is he had that trust that he was like, hey, even if I messed up and I ran away or did all the bad stuff, if I stumbled and fell, if I run back to him, I know he'll take me back. I love that trust. we got to have that too. Um, So Yeah, so you see the courage and trust that he was like, hey, I'm just going to run back to God regardless of what happens. And he realized too, like God hates sin. That's not, that doesn't change. Sin's still really bad. We have to be holy. We have to obey. But we do it through grace. And when we sin, he's our advocate. He forgives us. We might suffer the consequences, but he's right there to pick us up. So I'm going to ask you, do you believe that? If you're that person, then even if you're doing great things and all of a sudden you stumble and fall and you blow it, you blew your opportunity, every last chance you had was your last chance, and you asked for another one and you messed that one up too. You messed up your last chance, six, you know, the sixth last chance or the seventh last chance. But just like Ron was saying, his mercy and grace is still there. You just got to come. You got to receive it. So, but I love, he goes back and he honors the God and his, uh, honors God and honors his presence, and he brings the ark back to the city of David. 
So that's what rightly honoring God looks like and honoring his presence. Even when we mess up, we can run right to dad's chair. Remember, who, who remembers being a little kid, right? And even when you did something wrong, you had the, uh-oh. But you know, God, you know, your heavenly father, he's never mad at you if you run up and say you're sorry. And if earthly fathers are that good, that when your little kid who messes up comes running to you and asks for forgiveness, if you forgive them, how, how much more good is God? How much more forgiving is God to forgive us when we come running to his chair, right? <laughs> so verse 13. Again, you'll see some of these elements and parts of the story shift around. It says, And so it was when those bearing the ark, so I don't, I don't, I don't hear any oxen carrying arks. All of a sudden they're like, yeah, we got it on our shoulders. Everything's right where it should be. So when those who bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, that he sacrificed the oxen, and fatted sheep. So all of a sudden, guess what? Those oxen got put to good use. <laughs> and that's what they were for. They were for an offering. So I, I love seeing the change. that He learns his lesson and puts, them, puts things in order right where they should be. So you see, David learned his lesson. That's what I love about David. He'd mess up, but he'd learn. So I try to be that. Like, I'll mess up a lot, but hopefully I learn, you know? <laughs> so, so I just wanted to take a minute and just pause in the story. So what do you do when your strength fails and you stumble? You know, it's good to, lear- to, to learn the Bible story and learn the process of what David went through. But what do you do when he's mad, at, when you feel like he's mad at you? What do you do when you mess up and you know he's holy and you're not? What's your response? <laughs> Amen, exactly. You fall on your knees or your face. Even if you think I messed up and I disobeyed, it's the relationship is that. That's what gets you through. So I just want to encourage you. So just like we were saying, relationship is what gives us our strength. And I can give you a Bible verse for that. It says, Daniel eleven thirty two. It says, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. And that's talking about the Antichrist. So this is like serious times stuff. But his word says in Daniel, but the people who know their God, that's the relationship, the people who know their God, shall be strong and carry out great exploits. That's a promise of God we can stand on. I'm standing on that. If I know him, I can do great things for him. And it's because I know him, not because of my strength or I'm so strong. So how great is our God, right? That he, our relationship, he gives us that strength. And he's worthy of our worship and praise. So sometimes I know when you, when you feel forgiven, like in church, like, I, don't, I have no qualms with raising my hands and looking like a goof or, you know, singing and shouting and dancing around. I know, like, even Tammy, when she stands next to me, I move around so much when I'm playing my guitar. She'll have to kick over my cord, and I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm just digging it, you know? <laughs> so I love, I love the sing and worship. And even if I look goofy, I don't care because he's worthy of the, my best praise I can give him. So I love this, too, because you see David. David's like that. So verse 14, it says, Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. It's like, oh, don't, can you relate to that? Can you feel like that? When you know the feeling, okay, I messed up and I feel bad and shame, but just like no longer a slave, it says, you know, I'm trading my shame too in that other song. I'm trading all that away for the joy of the Lord. So I love it. Not only is he dancing and singing and shouting, because he's forgiven and he knows it. God and I are good, everything's good. But it says he was wearing a linen ephod. So I don't know if Isaac, if you could put the picture of the ephod up. So one thing you'll notice is it's kind of like a, I don't know, like an apron sort of thing. It was a priestly garment. Well, I didn't know David was a priest. Well, guess what? He's like, hey, t- no armor. It doesn't say anything about his armor, his strength, his big warrior muscles. It says he's wearing the ephod of a priest. And he's dancing and singing and shouting. So he, that's him. He's like, I'm not the warrior right now. I'm the worshiper. And guess what? That's the strongest thing he could have done, was that worshiper dress. That's his identity. Um, so that's the priestly garment. Because he, he learned his lesson. Now he's like, now I'm going to honor the presence. I'm going to you know, reverence the presence and worship him. So verse 15, so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a trumpet. And now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, so I'm sure... Don't, don't say their name if they're in here. 
but there might be one of these people in your life <laughs> when you're shouting. So it says, now, uh, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord. And she, and this is like dun, 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 despised him in her heart. Really? Like, that's, that's her husband. He got his groove back. He's, he's excited. He got his worship back. You know, he was upset and he thought he messed everything and he blew it. And now he's so excited and she's mad. You know, she's up there in the window upset at him. I'm, I was like I said, you might know somebody like that in your life that you're like, why are you trying to rain on my parade right now? You know? Um, so keep in mind too, so what's her story, right? Why is, she, why is she acting like this? Michael was Saul's daughter. So Saul was the king before David. He's like, hi, I'm the replacement, right? Well, Saul was, it says he was a foot taller and just, oh, he was so handsome. So he, he was the king that he's the king of good looks. He's got it all going on. In a room, you could find Saul because he was the good looking guy who was a foot taller than everybody. He looks good. Well, all of a sudden, she's like, I'm used to that. And you're dancing around like a fool right now. So she only cares about what it looks like in the outside. So that's what she doesn't like. And Saul, the other thing he's known for is his disobedience. He didn't obey God. And as a matter of fact, when he gets demoted from being king, he tells the prophet Samuel, and he says, hey, will you just walk back with me so people think I'm still good? Just that way it looks like everything's still okay? So she was in agreement with that dysfunction. And she liked David when he was the warrior out in the field fighting the battles, destroying the enemies of God. She likes that, even if it's not right, even if he's not right with God, if he looks good, that's okay. But when he gets right with God and it doesn't look good, she's not okay with that. So it's really a matter of thinking about who are the people in your life. You know, there's a saying, it says, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Well, think about the people in your circles. Are they the type of people that if it looks good, they like you? Or are they the type of people like, hey, what's really going on? (laughs) That when you get right, even if it looks bad, they still got your back. Those are the people you got to find out. So I think it's funny, too. She's the queen of Israel, presumably. So she's got all this extravagance and wealth and all this opulence. Everything looks amazing, right? And it's just extravagant, just no expense spared. If she she wants the service and the, the pageantry and stuff. That's fine for her. But when he does it for God, all of a sudden she's like, no, I don't like this. That's not okay. (laughs) So extravagance to look good, she thinks that's okay. But extravagance for God, all of a sudden, well, that's a little much, don't you think? So maybe you know one of those people in your friend's circle too. Like, well, that's a little much. You go to church how many times? How many times a month? Well, that's a lot. You read your Bible like every day? Like every day, every day? That's a little much. You know, you be, watch those people in your life, too. So I'm off track, but. Um, so, yeah, it's about agreement. So you can agree with the dysfunction, or you can get in agreement with God and get in alignment and order. So verse 17, it says, They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. And there David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And so I, I just walk through scripture really slowly, as I'm sure you all can tell. But when I, I just, when I read things like he had prepared a place for the Lord and he had erected a tabernacle for it, I was thinking like, well, when did he do that in the story? Like I'm trying to watch this movie play out. Like when did he build this? Well, this is just me. I think in those three months when even though he messed up and he's like, God's mad, okay, I, we need space. I messed up. I can't bring him close, but he started preparing He's like, I know that I'm going to be back with God. He's going to be close to me again. Or maybe even it was before that. I don't know. But I like to think it was then that even if he felt far, he's like, I'm still going to honor God and start taking steps towards honoring him rightly. So I love that his mentality in that moment, if I'm thinking through and putting myself in his shoes, his mentality must have been like, you know, I may not understand what's going on right now, I don't know why I feel distant or why God feels distant, but I'm going to prepare. And even in my sin, I know that he'll love me. 
And I expect that he'll come near and come back to me because he loves me. And I'm just going to honor him, even if I don't understand, even if I don't get it. And it sounds kind of weird, right? Like God's going to love us in our sin. And that's almost one you have to like think through. But there's a scripture for it. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, it was never about perfect obedience and be getting straight A's on your report card and never having messed up. God knew it was going to happen. Who here knows, like, God's not surprised when you messed up. He's not like, what? You know, that's why he said, put it on four dudes' shoulders, not put it on an ox cart that wobbles around. So, in uh, verse 18, when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Uh, verse 19, he distributed among all the people, among the multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone, a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. So to me, I just thought, you know, that must just be, the nation was blessed because the king honored God. Godly leadership produces blessings to a nation. So Ms. Mary, if you could come to the piano, please. <laughs> so as we start wrapping up here, I know... Verse 20 says, Then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So again, I'm there like, that's what you got out of that? He looked a little wild dancing around. That's, that's what you got out of that? He's excited and worshiping God for all he's been forgiven, and, and that's what you're upset about? he got a little crazy in front of the, like, the young kids. <laughs> but I thought of this verse in Luke 7. It says, Luke 7, 40, verse 47. It says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who has forgiven little shows only a little love. So David was so extravagant because he'd been forgiven extravagantly. You know, he said, he who's been forgiven much, loves much. You know, just like Pastor Jay, you know, like a month ago, he had that sermon about the prideful person and the humble person. The, the prideful person said, I'm great. I don't need nothing. So guess what? He got nothing. But the humble servant who said, I need God desperately. I need his presence. I need a miracle. Guess what he got? Everything he asked for. So I love David's response in 21. He says, so David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his household to appoint me ruler of the, over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord. So I love that. It's not pride in himself. He's not saying God chose me. He's saying God chose me. That's why I celebrate. The emphasis on God, not him. 22, and he says, and I will be more undignified than this. And I will humble, I will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maid servants of whom you've spoken, by them I'll be held in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. So the first, he realized, too, the first covenant that matters is between him and God. That one has to be in order for the second one to work. But I love, too, he says, oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> you think that's extravagant? Watch how I'm going to worship God. Watch what I'm going to do. There's a really good song by Ren Collective. It's called I Will Be Undignified. And it's just a celebration. It's, I will be undignified. I will praise the Lord my God with all my might. And I will leave my pride behind. Just, oh, just hearing that verse just makes me excited. So in closing, I wanted to say that, you know, no matter who, which person you are in this story, you know, first of all, if you're, if you're going through that, go ahead and shout and praise God. Be extravagant and worship him. Do that. And second, Psalm 107 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If he's done something big in your life, even after you messed up real bad, shout it out. And th third, if someone judges you, don't worry about it. Don't let someone else judge you about how you worship God. God's opinion and acceptance is the only thing that matters in your life. Other people's opinions of it don't. So if you could all stand. So again, I'm going to ask you for the last time, where are you in the story? Are you the one who is in sin and stumbled 
in the, sta- in the snares and you need help and forgiveness? Or are you a fighter? Have you been fighting on your own strength? And then maybe the, you got exposed for your lack of relationship. Or do you feel like God's mad or disappointment and you just desperately need him to show up and be in your relationship? Or are you in restoration and maybe you're just shouting with joy? Maybe you're undignified and people are hating on you. That's okay. The answer is always to come near and worship him and honor his presence. He's full of forgiveness and rich in mercy. And he is so worthy of our praise. And so, Lord, I just want to close in prayer. Lord, your word says in Zechariah 4, verse 6, he answered them, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. And maybe it's the, the word of the Lord for us in Fond du Lac today. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And Lord, we pray that would be real in our life. That you, Lord, we're so thankful for your forgiveness. We're thankful for the victory. We're thankful that if we stumble and fall, you're there to forgive us and pick us up. We're thankful that if there's a distance between us, it wasn't you who moved. Lord, we just need to come running back to you. Lord, we thank you for that today. Lord, we just worship you and praise you. And we pray we'd honor your presence, not just in church, but as we go forward into our weeks and in our lives and in our families and workplaces, that you would just be lifted up and magnified and honored and that your presence, that we would just be aware of it all week long. And I just thank and praise you for that in Jesus' name.